Hello, everybody. Welcome to 360 Coaching with Premier Approaches to Teaching and Learning. Today I have with me Sean Hurt. Hello, Ms. Williams. Thank you for having me on this program. I am super excited to have you. I've been a follower of Sean for so long, it seems like. Um, when you think about people who are leaders of the field and just change agents, Sean is the one. So I would consider him kind of like my mentor. Um, and it's been a while. Uh, he has transformed nationally recognized schools. You know, he became a principal and he has really uh, been able to raise achievement for our students. So just, just to know somebody like that or have somebody like that in your corner is so amazing. He's been nationally recognized and received multiple awards for being the change agent. So welcome today to our presentation. Go ahead and tell us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm just excited just to be here. Just a little bit about myself as I've been in education for 21 years, been a principal for the last 12 years, and I've worked at, uh, at three different schools, high school, middle school, and elementary, and every school that I've worked at, um, uh, we've been able to raise student achievement and just do all of these out-of-the-box radical strategies that have, uh, have uh, gotten good results. Our kids currently are, are performing at an all-time high. I got students who, uh, when my students eight or nine years ago, graduating with their bachelor's degree, master's degree. So I'm just here to kind of share some of the strategies to people all over the world so we can go ahead and improve these schools and really just take education to a whole nother level. No, I'm so excited for this because I've been waiting for this. And many teachers and our instructional leaders and principals have been asking for this for a while now. And so here we go. Practical strategies for raising student achievement. This is Mr. Sean Hurt. All right. All right. So I'm just excited to be here. And I'm just going to talk about some of the strategies that I've been using for the last, like I said, 12 years or so as a principal. And these strategies that I've used have really, I've really seen some really good academic achievement, kids moving in the right direction, and just going to a whole nother level. Not only myself, but also teachers uh, have found that teaching in the classroom is so much easier. Uh, they're not wasting time doing things that really doesn't make sense. You know, you know, we always say, hey, instead of working harder, let's work smarter. And, and so for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about how we can work smarter and how you can take these strategies and use them tomorrow. And you will, and you will definitely see an improvement on your classroom management, academic achievement. If you're a principal or a superintendent or work as a leadership team, you will see things that you can really – focus on just to move the academic needle. So the first thing I always talk about is, is why do we need high performance schools? So when you look at the data, it says 40% of children living in poverty are prepared for primary schooling. Okay. Studies have found out by the age of four children, middle upper class families hear 30 million more words than children and families on welfare. Imagine that. This is this right here really gives me by the end of the fourth grade, African American, Hispanics, and low income students are already two years behind. By the time they reach the 12th grade, they are four years behind. So imagine your fourth graders, and I know that you're thinking, like, wow, Mr. Hurt, you are right. I teach fourth grade, and they're coming to me at a first grade or kindergarten level. How do I really impact student achievement when these kids? are supposed to already know how to read, but they're coming to me at the age of 10, 11 years old and can't read. This last one blows my mind. More than 30 million children are growing up in poverty in one low income community. There's only one book for every 300 children. So, so imagine this, imagine you have one book, one book, right? And you give it to 300 children. One, and one book is supposed to, 300 children are supposed to share this one book. So when you look at this data, you know, why do we need high-performing schools? Well, we really don't have a choice in this matter. If you keep on doing the same thing over again, you're going to keep on getting the same results. So what's going on in education is that we've been doing the same thing for 50, 60, 70 years, and we've been getting the same results. So what I decided 12 years ago, I said, you know what? 
as a principal, I'm going to do something totally different because I have nothing to lose. I knew that if I was going to try these strategies, my school is going to still be a failing school. How about I try something different that's going to address the needs of the students and then hopefully we'll get some different outcomes. And lo and behold, when I was a principal in, at my first school, we went from the lowest of the lowest achieving school in the district to some of the highest in our district and also in our county. So I know that these strategies I'm going to give to you do work, and they work consistently across the board. So the, so the first question I always ask is that, do these students that you see in this picture, whether they're high school students, middle school students, or elementary, do they look like your students? And a lot of times they say, yes, Mr. Hurt, they look like my students. So these pictures are students of, 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 of kids that I was the principal of, okay? So, you know, so these are my students. These are real life students. So they probably look like your kids. But the reality is this. They come from situations like this. So, so when, I, when I'm in my office, I'm currently in my office. When I look out of my door, these are the houses that my kids come from. This is their reality. This is not a game. This is no, okay, let's make it. No, these are the houses that they come from. I'm looking outside now, and this is where they come from. These are the houses that they come from. So when you know that they're coming from an environment like this, there's no mentor program on here. There's no library down the street here. There's no little YMCA. There's no, okay, a bank around the corner. None of that stuff is taking place. You got, you, you. You got drugs on the street. You got poverty taking place. You got gun violence, things of that. And this is their, their reality. So the first question that I ask out of any, any school leader is that, do you really believe that kids can achieve the same educational goals uh, as children who are not in poverty? Do you like, really, but before we talk about pedagogy, before we talk about changing, or do you believe what's in your heart to tell you that these kids can learn? Now, if you really believe that, then now you got to take out of your mind some of the preconceived notions that these kids are coming from, from these environments, okay? We understand, like I said, we understand that, they, that this is their reality. This is their, their reality. But now, how do you transform your school to be able to address the needs of these students? So let me ask you, so this is the reality for a lot of our schools. Yes. And how would you get this information from the teachers to then again give training to them, the training that they need to ensure that all students can learn? Well, I think, you know, it's just a couple of things that, like, I do training for districts and things of that nature regarding culturally responsive teaching, mm -hmm. you know, and let me just be how to really teach black and, and Latino kids coming from poverty because that's totally different than if I'm uh, teaching kids who have uh, well-to-do families or who are on grade level or whose environment doesn't look like this. That's a totally different dynamics than when you're coming from this. Both kids can learn, but you have to structure your school. And I'm going to talk about it in my PowerPoint, structure totally different to be able to address it. So for example, 12, 12 years ago when I was a principal, we have 500 African-American kids in our school, and they all came from inner city poverty, okay? So the first thing I said, I said, before we learn about math, English, and everything else like that, we're going to learn how black kids from poverty learn. We're going to read articles. We're going to understand where they come from. We're going to get on the school bus, and we're going to drive through their neighborhoods, and we're going to spend 25 minutes on their streets. I want you to understand where they wake up in the morning. I want you to see where they're playing basketball at. I want you to see where they're eating at. I want you to see where they're walking to school from and where they're going home from. I want you to get that whole environment in because in a couple more weeks, we got 500 kids coming from these streets right here. All That's right? creative. That is really creative to get the teachers out of their comfort zone. I love that idea. Yeah, because, because the reality of it, you know, I didn't have money to be able to say, all right, I got a half a million dollars or a million dollars to do all this stuff. We had little to no resources, so we had to take what we had and make it work and make it and make it and, and make it and make it work. So what so what take place is this? This is this is what the reality of it. 
Far too many of our kids arrive in school with less. Vocabulary, preschooling, educational learning experience, books, the whole nine yards, we can see it. So they, they arrive with less, and then when they come into our school, we give them less. That makes no sense. So then now, when you come into my schools, is that when you come into the hallway, we have pictures of our students hanging up from our ceiling. Okay. Our classrooms are clean. Well, well, her all classrooms are supposed to be clean. No, all all classrooms are not clean. Okay. So how can the kids code switch? Now, follow me very closely. How can they code switch from where they're coming from, where where they're coming from, their house or their bedroom, and they come into your school and your school looks like their neighborhood? The classroom looks like their bedroom because they got socks and food in the bedroom while well, I come to the classroom. My classroom messed up. It's, it's crayons on the floor. It's posters hanging out. So how can they code switch? You understand? So then, once again, if you look at these pictures, these are some of my middle school students. You know, if you look at that picture right there, we talk about, you know, watch us grow. We talk about, you know, uh, being positive with the kids and things of that nature. Because, once again, we know the environment is giving them less we got to provide for them more, okay? And the other thing is that I talk about this. I talk about if you're really serious about educating the kids, you're, you're not teaching math. You're teaching Matthew. I'm going to say that again so people can get this. <laughs> All right, you have, to, you have to really get this. You're not teaching math. You're teaching Matthew. Now, what do you mean, brother? Her, what do you mean by that? When you're teaching math, you're teaching the content. You're teaching the standards, blah, blah, blah. You got the book. You teach it. The reason why we're failing the kids is because we're teaching the content and we're not teaching the Matthew. When you teach the Matthew, you, you already know what Matthew likes and dislikes. You already know, you know, where he does what, what he does on Saturday and Sunday. You already know, you know, his mood swings. So you get to know him. And when you get to know these kids, then consequently it's easier for you to teach math. But a lot of times we want to teach math and we neglect the human side of these students. No, I appreciate it. It's how do we get to the whole child and do we know our kids enough to, you know, create scaffolds for their needs? So no, yes, you are right on, on top of things. Yeah. Because once again, just like I said, now when we're going to the neighborhoods, we got to be in the neighborhoods to understand, okay, what, what's, what are these needs of these kids? And that's why mass affair cannot be the norm for students, mm. schools, principals, leadership teams, you have to change how you do it. It is impossible. You will not improve academic achievement if you do not do it differently. Schools that are that are really raising the and I'm going to show you some data. Schools that's really raising the academic needle are doing it totally different. So I'm going to show you some data real quick. So, so when I started, so this is a data point. So let's take fifth grade. So mind you. We took a test, and I came to the school, and, and you see that we was doing Common Core, Common Core numbers, base 10, fifth grade standard. So in, in uh, September, we had, I think, 100 fifth graders who took this test in the beginning of the year. 94% of them needed improvement. So 94% of my kids flunked, flunked the test All right, in the beginning of the year. We had 6% of them that showed satisfactory. So the data was telling me, okay, they're coming to us low, but I just need to be able to move this academic needle. We need to do something totally different. So within three months, look at this data. Within three months, we did something totally different. The same concept that the kids took, we went from no kids showing mastery to 71% of our kids showing mastery or passing this concept within three months. Oh my God. I'm just imagining like all the pieces that needs to be in place for teachers, students. I mean, um, there's so many things that's going through my mind right now. It's like, how, how do you move the needle uh, with your teachers and your students that doing, you know, with this challenging um, opportunity ahead of you? Well, you know what, you know, I talk about once again, you know, when you're doing your training, Culturally responsive teaching. Mm. Okay, first, let's, de let's deal with that. Also, a lot of times, and I'm going to talk about a lot of times, principals, we don't have a vision for our school. Mm. So we'll say, all right, we want to have 
a good learning environment. We want all the stakeholders to do good, blah, blah, blah. No, no, that's, that's not a vision. What, what do you have a place that can be measurable at the end, at the end of the year? Mine is I want 1.5 years work to growth in math reading by the end of the year. Because remember, I talked about it. our kids are coming three or four years behind. If I could do 1.5 years worth of growth, I'm closing the gap. I'm, I'm closing the gap. So like, for example, let me show you this right here. When I started off at this school, at this one particular school in 2012, they were doing seven years worth of growth, okay? They were actually growing seven years. They could have stayed at home and watched Sesame Street and grew more watching TV than coming to school. You're supposed to grow one year, but they were growing seven months. So they were falling behind coming to school. First year, we put the strategies in place in 2013, 14, close to 1.7 years worth of growth in math, 1.4 the next year, 1.5. And the list goes on and on. In 2016, our school was, was classified as a model school. This is math. So consequently, if you're three years behind, if you were staying in our school for four years, we were going to catch you up. So it was a process that we had to do. So before we go to proficiency, we got to grow the kids, okay? Mm -hmm. And my leadership team understood this, all right? The same thing with reading, too. You know, our reading got to turn around. So these are the things that we was doing in reading. Once again, when you have goals, then consequently, you can progress monitor, make sure you're achieving the goals. A lot of times, we're scared to deal with the elephant in the room. We know, everybody know that the school is not failing. Everybody know when they come to school that it's going to be fights taking place. Everybody know that. So why do we hide it like it's not happening when it's happening instead of saying, all right, these, this is what's going on. How do we address these needs of these students? How do we leadership team, principal leadership team, what do we have a place that's going to help us progress monitoring and learning that's taking place inside of the classroom? How do we improve parental involvement? What, is, what do those things look like? So I'm going to get to it. So, so, uh, so once again, raising the uh, achievement bar, the first thing is that we made sure that we had high academic standards for our kids, first thing. All right. We're not going to lower the standards. What do you mean by that? We know that they're coming from poverty. We know that they're coming from inner city. We know that... Now, Raheem saw his uncle die last week. Reality. Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's put it out there. But then now the other flips, and this is a high school class right here. The other flip side to it is that now when they come into the school, we're not going to use that as a pity party to say, all right, we're going to lower our standards. No, we're going to have rigorous curriculum. We're going to demand excellence. We're going to make sure that, you know, kids are learning. So, for example, this is a culturally responsive classroom. You see the kids sitting in cooperative groups. Let's just deal with that. A lot of times we have kids in roles. Well, we know what the research says is that kids that sit in cooperative, when kids sit in cooperative groups, they learn better from one another. All right. You see, you see this teacher, teacher. The teacher's always circular, circulating around inside of the classroom. All right. So that's just one little aspect based on this picture that's showing you that if you just set the classroom up different, you'll get some, uh, you know, you'll get some different results. No, I, I, I love it. Um, I often wonder, like, what, so I'm thinking, so I guess the teachers were sitting and doing vertical planning, planning time, but what is the one, what are some things that you did different? I know a school in Los Angeles, I was reading about them, one of the things they did was uh, kind of interview every child that came in and kind of document it to find areas of support that they can help the families. And so kind of connecting them to the resource once they got there. What are some kind of outside of the box things that you do at your school? Because this is really, really, really good. Well, let's just deal with this is that, um, is that like in the beginning of the year when schools have open houses and stuff like that, every school have open house. Well, what we did two years ago is that we said, all right, we want the parents to come into our open house, but also we want to reach our parents. So what I did was I went into the community and I asked five businesses if they could come to the open house and set up a table. Okay, these are businesses. And would they be willing to 
bring in applications and can my parents fill out applications on the spot? They told me, Mr. Hurt, not only will we allow them to fill out applications, but we will hire them on the spot. Oh wow! Okay, now, 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 this is now, this is now. We talking about reaching the whole community. Okay, so now what I did was I told my parents. I said, if you got anybody looking for it, these are the five, five jobs that's coming in. Bring your resume, bring anything you got. If you fit any of these jobs, they're gonna hire you on the spot. If it's not you, if you got an uncle, church member, whoever it is, grandma, whoever it is, if they fit these categories, they come in. So we had our open house. We had 92% of our parents attend our open house. I wanted the parents to come in to make sure that they hear what the teacher got to say. Now, 92% of the parents came. On that particular day, 60 parents either A, got a job, or B, fill out an application. Wow. So within an hour from 6 to 7 o'clock, I got parents just, it changed the whole dynamics of the world. Now, we talk about poverty right now. We talk about, you know, so now... If I'm coming, if I'm waking up and on the day I don't got a job and then by 7 o'clock I got a job, how is that changing the mindset of those kids coming to the school? Yes, mindset and the mindset of the community and the family members who are just grateful and dedicated and are willing to go above and beyond to support the school, the students. So you forever have a, a community, a family yeah to call on whenever you need it. So yeah. that is amazing. Yeah, and then and it cost me a penny because once again, they came for free. I then my parents was there. So it was a win-win for, for everybody. The the other thing is that when you really want to move, and I'm, I'm giving them some strategy, when you really want to move to academic needle, the next thing is that you must understand your data. And, and I really talk about that. And once again, we're scared to, it's, it's sort of like, if you know that you are overweight and you eating and you eating good, you scared to get on that scale. You know that those that shirt don't fit too good. You 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 know it. You've been eating cake every day. You've been eating ice cream. You you having a good time. You've been on chill mode for three months, <laughs> and you feel it in your clothes. But when you go by that scale, you scared to get on that scale because you don't want to see what the scale say. Same thing with us. We know our data isn't good, but we're scared to put it out there and look at it and say, this is where we're at. So you got to get on the scale and say, all right, I weigh 280 pounds. You got to do it. You got to say, okay, only 15% of our kids are proficient in math. All right. Now, at the end of the year, I want to go from 280 pounds to 200 pounds. I, I got to lose 80 pounds. At the end of the year, I want to go from 15% of our kids proficient to 30% of our kids being proficient. All right? So that's the that's the vision. That's the goal, the vision of the school. Then from there, now we train our teachers. Look here. On culturally responsive learning. My goal is to increase from 15 to 40. Now I'm going to train my teachers on the things that's going to make us reach those particular goals that we have. You got me so far? And not only train them in the beginning of the year, but now we're training them throughout the year. How we call, how kids should be, how the classroom should be set up. A lot of times we don't know how to address the young inner city boy in the classroom because he's active, he's moving around, so we want to put him in special ed. We tell the teachers, okay, we notice that 95% of your lessons are geared toward left brain learners. Most women are left, most girls, most women, most young ladies are left brain learners. Let's make it 50-50 or 60-40. Let's have movement take a place inside of the classroom. Let's have kids building stuff inside of the classroom. Let's have some technology, you know. So when, so when we have that, instead of doing whole group lessons, let's go from whole group to now 80% of the small learning communities and now I'm using the data. Oh, I'm talking good. Now I'm using the data to be able to get those seven to eight kids that's on a cusp, and I'm working with them. Mm -hmm. So now my uh, disciplinary problems are decreasing. I'm not referring more kids to special ed, and I'm really tackling the needs of the kids because it goes back. I'm not teaching math. I'm teaching to Matthew. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, okay. Now, the other thing that we need to do is that now, how do you progress monitor what the kids are learning? Let's go back to the scale. 
if you're losing 80 pounds, you don't get on a scale at the end of the year and say, did I lose 80 pounds? You get on a scale every week. Oh, I lost four, I lost five, I lost six, to build up to the 80. If you have a bad week, you go back and say, you know what? I ain't work out. I was eating. I was enjoying myself, whatever. Same thing with education. We will teach standards. We'll teach lessons, but we don't stop to say, did the kids get it or not? Mm -hmm. We don't have nothing in place for us to, we don't have any data mechanisms in place to be able to say, okay, did those kids understand base 10 uh, concepts? If they did not, we need to reteach. If they did, who are those three or four kids in my classroom that didn't get it? That data is not taking place. So what we do is every week we bring data to the table and we look at it and we figure out out of these 300 kids, how many of them got it, didn't get it. And then we kind of make our after school programming, our intervention throughout the week. You know, everything that we're doing is based on the data. It's not based on my feelings. My emotions is based on data. So now consequently, when you're dealing with the data, the data doesn't lie. The data is going to tell you where to put your money at, your resources, your time, your energy, X, Y, Z. No, okay. the concept is to actually leverage the after-school program to meet the needs of the in-school day. Yeah. Um, that's a foreign concept in certain areas uh, because some people feel like that's not my area that is this external program that's not connected to the school. So how do you, um, how are you able to connect with the after school program where you just speak to the director or to make sure they're implementing the supports needed for your students to be successful? Well, in my case, see, once again, my leadership team is so good. My after school program director is my assistant principal. Mm. So once again, my leadership team, hey, we, we're about educating kids. So you might say, well, her, I can't do that because of whatever. Okay. Your after school program is he or she sending in on your data meetings throughout the week. Mm. When their teachers are turning in lesson plans, are they getting those lesson plans also? You know, and not even, you know what, let's just, let me just be very, just transparent. My custodians understand what we're trying to do. My hall monitors understand what we're trying to do. Everybody in understands well. so our data is not only in the classrooms, but when you come into the school, you'll see data just hanging up from the wall. You understand what I'm saying? Everything, everybody is connected to what we do. So we have a thing that I do. It's called from 9 to 11, 11 o'clock. It's called All Hands on Deck. All right, now let me explain this to you. I never understood why, why we got educators in the building and they'll, and they'll pull kids out or they'll be in the hallway and stuff like that. I'm like, it makes sense that everybody going to the classroom and we and we're working with kids. So I'm a principal. I'm gonna go into the classroom and work with two or three kids. Every hand is gonna be on deck for two hours to make sure every kid is being reached and touched. Well, why is that important? Because now when we're having these uh, uh, PLCs, data meetings, or whatever it may be, I'm not talking to you as your boss. I know that Raheem is struggling with two-digit addition because I worked with him. Mm. So now I'm like, okay, what do we got to do, Mr. Stevens, to make sure that, that we can go ahead and get Raheem on grade level? I understand your – so now it's that collaboration. That's, that's a fluid just idea of we are all one, we are all helping students. So I love that, you know, that – you know, just that, that concept of we're on the same page and we're all helping. I, I, I love that. Yeah. The third thing is the high expectation. And I've talked about that before. You know, we have to have high expectations. So when they're turning that writing assignment, you can't say, you know, and I always use Raheem because that's my fictional student. Mm -hmm. Oh, Raheem, I understand your mother and your father. No, Raheem, we got to improve this writing. You might not be here in October, but by uh, December, January, you're going to be at that level. So go back and revise this and turn it to me different. We can't have pity parties for these kids. All right, because this is the thing. If my expectations are, is right here and they might not meet it, they might meet it right here, it's better than my expectations being down here and they meet it down here. All right, so, so we believe in greatness is in everybody. The last thing is that you must invest in some quality professional development. A lot of times we do 55 things. Oh, I heard we got this, that, and the third. Okay. 
how many of those things are really working? How about you scale it down and do two or three things good and it will manifest itself in other things? Once again, at my school, we do, we do three things and we do it good. We know our data like the back of our hand. We know that all, all of our kids, our black kids, come from inner city, so we know everything about that piece, okay? And we have high expectations. So all of our professional development is, is geared toward those three things. Mm. And we know that if we do, do those three things good, they will manifest itself in other things. It's just like this. If you go to Burger King, they're known for their burgers. They don't, they're not known for pizza. Mm -hmm. You understand? If you go to Pizza Hut or Little Caesars, they're not making fries. They're known for pizza. At schools, we just known for those three things, and we do it good, and it gets us these type of uh, these type of uh, awards that we're getting. The last thing is that you must develop your leadership team. Now, I'm going to boast about this. Being a principal for 12 years, I currently have nine people that work at other schools that are either principals or assistant principals, and they've been my former teachers. I'm going to say that again. We got to get this, principals. I've been a principal for 12 years. Currently, I have nine, I have nine former teachers that are, that are principals and assistant principals currently at different schools in different school districts. So for me, I tell them all of the time, I want you to go to the next level. If you're a teacher and you want to be an assistant principal, let me take you there. So I'm investing in my staff. I don't, I don't hoard the power. I can't do it by myself. I want everybody to be part of this because, once again, if I empower you to use your ability, it's going to have a direct impact on the students. And then when the, and when the students feel good, then we have high academic achievement. Then it goes back to you. So when it's time for promotions, when school districts are looking for principals, assistant principals, they come and get you because our scores are high and they know that you're ready. And then that's how you scale the work. That's how you take it outside of the 500 kids at my school or 300, and now you're going to other schools and you're doing the same thing. And now the work is being scaled. And that's how you really close those gaps. And that's how you improve inner city education and take it to the next level. So um, I have a just quick question. How, yeah. not, so where does your professional development come from? Because we all have these, um, we can outsource or we can offer them ourselves. And then if you're doing it yourself with your team, um, that seems very exhausting. And yeah. so it seems like you are doing so much for your school, um, doing that plus keeping up with the ongoing professional development for a month, that just seems like a lot of work. Well, you know what, you know what, my, um, like, like I said, my vision is by 2025, I want to work with 25 or more schools nationwide and be able to touch 50,000 students, okay? This is what my, this is my, this, this is my passion. So consequently, um, I'm training, I'm going out to districts, I'm getting that word out, you know, I'm showing them the data, and, 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 and what I'm seeing is that if I can be able to scale myself, scale the work, be able to say, okay, I've done it, now I need other people to do it at their school, and then it's going to be a ripple effect, you know. I'm passionate about it. I've seen it for many years that these kids can learn, you know. I see it. When I was a principal, I said, if I could just improve one school, then I'm going to tell the whole world about it. Well, now this is my third school. So now I know what I've just said for the last 40 minutes do work. It's been proven. I have data to show it. Now we need to get these other schools doing it because, once again, I don't feel good waking up in the morning and saying, okay, my school is doing good. My leadership team is doing good. But I know good and well that there are schools in Florida that needs this work in California, Indiana. Atlanta, wherever you are, there's more schools that need this work. So how do I reach that on a global mass? And I'm passionate about it. So I'm I'm telling everybody that I'm I'm there for them. I want to do the work. I want to get it out there because these kids can learn. Yes. So uh, this is a book, you know, that I just wrote a couple of years ago, and it talks about the strategies that I'm using to transform inner city schools. So it gives a really good foundation on the work that I'm doing 
the things that uh, I did that might not have been positive. You know, I don't want educators to do that. But also the things that I did that helped me move this academic needle, helped me take it to the next level, you know. And uh, you can pick that book up from our uh, website, shurtschoolturnaroundspecials.com, you know, or you can reach me on Twitter, Facebook every uh, Sunday at 7 o'clock. I'm doing Facebook Lives. I'm talking about it. You know, during this COVID-19, I'm doing virtual uh, professional developments with leadership teams. So whatever I have to do to get it out there, I'm open to it. No, I, you know, I commend you. You are everywhere. And every time I see pictures of, you know, students hanging from the ceiling, I think of you because uh, that's just, you know, it, it just brings me joy to think that students can come in and see their face and be just proud. And, you know, with the book, don't forget, you got to get the book. Yeah. Um, you know, Sean Hurt, go on his website, get his book and follow him because he provides great tips, his videos are good, and just good insight on things that you could do at your school. Yeah, yeah, Noah, let me give a, a testimony. Last two years ago, I got a call from a principal in South Carolina. Currently, I'm in Michigan, but a school I was working with in South Carolina. She called me three days after Christmas, okay, because they were a priority school and the state was about to take them over. So I worked with them for a year, really good team. She called me three days after Christmas. And in the background, I'm hearing a whole bunch of people yelling and screaming, music playing. She said, Mr. Hurt, I want to tell you that we got our scores back. We are off the priority list. I told my teachers we're going to have a party. They came up to the score. We're partying. And I just want you to hear about the assignment that, that's displaying from these teachers. And I can't wait to tell the community. And that brought tears to my eyes because I'm like, wow, you know what? When you hear, when you hear testimonies like that, you hear principals like, I could keep my job because I was going to lose my job. When you hear teachers saying, hey, these 800 kids, we know we can learn now. We have confidence now. We're going to go to another level. That's what it's all about. And like I know, I know without a shadow of doubt that kids can learn, inner city kids can learn. We just have to change how we go about fixing our schools and then win our schools and we will see a, a positive impact on student achievement. Wow. So thank you so much. You guys follow Sean Hurt, but I appreciate you for spending the time with me and hanging with us. And I know that you guys will take away so many good tips. And if you need extra support, you can always reach out to them. So thank you, Mr. Hurt. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, Mrs. Williams. You know, I love what you're doing. Been following you and, and I'm, and, you know, developing our relationship. So I'm a big fan of you, of your work of of everything that you're doing so thank you very it was an honor coming on your show it was an honor thank you so much <laughs> talk to you later okay thank you